Greetings and salutations, East Africa. Welcome to your world on this last Monday of October. Yeah, that's how fast the days of 2020 are passing by. Now, on this day, we focus on the status of higher education, even as the education cycle takes effect after months of uncertainty in the education sector in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. We shall also put special focus on the role of technology and innovation amidst the disruption and the silver lining the pandemic has created for institutions of higher education. My name is Gladys Gashenja and before we get into all that, here is what else you can expect. <laughs> New technological facelift. Algerian kids are back to school after closing down for seven months. And uh, babies that are in Russia, courtesy of uh, Chinese surrogate mothers will soon be reunited. Thank you for joining us on the broadcast. As I mentioned, today we focus on technology and innovation in institutions of higher learning. And the question of the day to you is, is technology and innovation the new backbone of higher education? We're talking about universities, colleges, etc. Or do we still have room for face-to-face -face learning? Well, talk to us. That hashtag is new normal on our social media platforms. And you can also reach us on that number at the bottom of your screen. But before we get to it, let's take a look at the impact of COVID-19 around the world in terms of the numbers. And this morning, we stand at 43,343,797 people who have been confirmed to have contracted COVID-19. Those who have recovered from that number stands at 31,900,840, or rather 900, yes, 845 people. And those who have succumbed to the same, unfortunately, stands at 1,159,082 people well let's take a look at the same impact but in the kenyan context that number stands at 49,721 confirmed cases out of that, 34,209 people have totally recovered. And unfortunately, we have lost 902 Kenyans to COVID-19. Now, it was interesting to actually see that survey released by TIFA yesterday with many people saying that they feel like we are out of the woods and that for some, COVID never existed. Well, the truth of the matter is it is here with us and those numbers are increasing in as far as the number of infections and those succumbing to the same. So do take care and take the necessary precautions. Well, let's take a look at some of the stories making headlines this morning. Nearly 60 years ago, a number of babies, toddlers and children died during their spell in a hockey camp run by the French army in the south of the country. Now, Haki is a native Muslim Algerians who served as auxiliaries in the French army during the Algerian War of Independence from 1954 to 1962. The children were often given a perfunctory burial at night wrapped in a towel and without the dignity of a ceremony. Over the next 50 years, the makeshift cemeteries hiding dozens of bodies were left unattended and now families of former Hakis through associations and their own personal initiatives are trying to bring the dead out of anonymity to give them a funeral they deserve. Prier. Mm -hmm. 
Burundi's former president Pierre Buyoya said Wednesday that he rejected a life sentence he received in absentia this week, that is last week rather, over the 1993 assassination of his successor, dismissing the case as politically motivated. Buyoya was convicted for an attack against the head of state over his role in the death of President Malchior Ndadaye in 1993. And a court in Burundi sentenced him to life in prison. And he said, we reject these judgments which are in no way binding on us, Buyoya said an ethnic Tutsi first came to power in Burundi in a coup in 1987. He stepped down in 1993 in the country's first democratic elections in which Ndadai Ahutu beat him resoundingly. But hardline ethnic Tutsi soldiers killed Ndadai just four months into the job. And in Algeria, upon entering the private schools in Algiers, children have their temperature taken and a teacher shows them how to properly wash their hands using hydroalcoholic gel on the first day back to school. After more than seven months of closure across Algeria due to the health measures to curb the spread of the coronavirus pandemic, Nadia Odia, French teacher at the primary school, says for us, it is certainly new, but we do our best to make it go as well as possible while respecting the sanitary directives. A parent at the school says we are happy for the new school year to finally begin, but with some great apprehension at the same regarding the current situation. We are confident at the school level and we know that the schools have made their arrangements and our children are also quite aware of the current situation. Let's hope that everyone will go along. Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari warns protesters not to undermine national security as he avoids addressing the shooting of demonstrators after days of unrest. The result of this is clear to all observers. Human lives have been lost, acts of sexual violence have been reported, two major correctional facilities were attacked and convicts freed, public and private properties completely destroyed or vandalized. I therefore call on our youth to discontinue the street protests and constructively engage government in finding solutions. Your voice has been heard loud and clear, and we are responding. And I call on all Nigerians to go about their normal businesses and join security agencies to protect lives and properties of all law-abiding citizens without doing harm to those they are meant to protect. Let me pay tribute to officers of the Nigeria Police Force who have tragically lost their lives in the line of duty. <laughs> to our neighbors in particular, and members of the international community, many of whom have expressed concern about the ongoing development in Nigeria, we thank you and urge you all to seek to know all the facts available before taking a position or rushing to judgment and making hasty pronouncements.
And still in Nigeria, Nigerian professional footballer Edion Igalo posts a video to social media platform Twitter in which he reacts to the shooting of peaceful protesters in Lagos, saying that he is ashamed of the current Nigerian government. There was no immediate death toll from the incident in which witnesses said armed gunmen opened fire on a crowd of over a thousand people to disperse them after a cafe was imposed to end spiraling protests of a police brutality. Oh, 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 I'm sad and I'm broken. I don't know where to start from. Uh, I'm not the kind of guy that talks about politics, but I can't keep quiet anymore for what is going on back home in Nigeria. I would say Nigerian government, you guys are ashamed to the world for killing your own citizens, sending military to the street to kill unarmed food protesters because they are protesting for their rights. It's uncalled for. You people will be remembered in the history as the first government that sent military to the city to start killing their own citizens. I am ashamed of this government. We are tired of you guys and we can't take this anymore. I'm calling the UK government, calling all those leaders in the world to please see what is going on in Nigeria and help us, help the, the, the poor citizens. The government are killing their own citizens. We are calling you guys, the UN, to see to the matters. And I want to call my brothers and sisters back home to remain safe. Be indoors, please don't come out. Because this government, they are killers. And they will keep killing if the world did not talk about this. God bless you all. And remain safe. One Nigeria. We move. When do you want to answer us? Now. A situation that we keep our eyes on and update you as and when we get more details from Nigeria. But back home and focusing on our conversation of the day, the COVID-19 pandemic has grounded industrial operations and disrupted supply chains across the world, making access to key preventative devices such as thermal guns difficult. As such, most countries resorted to manufacturing of necessary equipment, giving way to innovators to model and incubate locally made solutions. This is the story of two young men from Kajiado who have developed a contact-free temperature checking device. Nayoma Sampao spoke to them. Temperature checks before accessing commercial and residential buildings has become common in monitoring COVID-19 infections. But most guards and front office operators are not well equipped to handle the equipment or worse still how to respond in the case of an alarming result. It is because of this that two brothers from Gong area of Kajiado County have devised an automated temperature checking device which minimizes physical contact. Basically, the machine here is connected to a power cable, so you have to make electricity. Once you have a sensor, you just need the sensor is Once you detect your temperature, the barriers are open. That is, if your temperature is between that range, at least COVID is a science like see above 37. As for now, it's above 37. If you're above 37, it won't access you in upper. To the Angalese challenges the COVID during period, because mostly the soldiers are from Lang, they want to come into close contamination or keep them out to temperature. So we started looking for a solution. We let Neza, Unda, machine in Neza Fanya, EO staff here, Kupima temperature, nine access what to prove maybe in malls, maybe like supermarkets, and etc. All materials used have been sourced locally, finding local solutions to local problems at a time when international supply chains have been disrupted. Main materials in Tumatumia Pacuna aluminium pipes, easy to listen to Sapa Gikomba, because those are doers plus this. Chrome pipes, then the others to menunua kwa electronic shops, uh, like the servo motors and the ETC, then the PVC boards. Na sasa hii ni black sheets hapa yenye nimekanyaga. The temperature is measuring very well. Uh, like now I've just measured is 35. My temperature, which is the normal temperature that I normally see on supermarkets and everywhere that I normally see. So I'm really encouraging and uh, probably the government to come on board to support this initiative of these young fellas to take it to the next level. As you know, our youths are really facing problems of unemployment. Finding gainful employment has been a major challenge for Kenyan youth. 
Many now see innovation as a way out. We really have some few challenges to key, to key build, like lack of funds, at least to stay in Kidogo. As could, could get some items, like what the kids like to to rejaribu, na to kazipata. So in kipata maybe funding, I can build this most for schools. Like for now, government don't attack open schools. Instead of them buying thermal guns, to cut to neza wafai. Due to some challenges, education sequeza kumalizia yote kupasu. But hopefully, if things goes well, badu kuna yo chance to neza neza enlarge mas of myangu neza broaden that is. And you know, can is a fanya much bigger than this. One of the symptoms of COVID-19 is high temperature. An invention like this will come in handy in checking temperature and in essence curbing the spread of COVID-19. Nayoma Sampao, NTV, Ngong, Kajiado County. Impressive, which uh, goes to focus on the fact that there's a lot of innovators out there and we need to focus on what they have to offer and also support them on their journey. And speaking of which, we have two innovators in studio and we are talking about David Ngamau, who is a Chief Technical Officer at Client Air. We're also joined by Caroline Wamoyo, who is a Chief Finance Officer at Client Air. Thank you guys for joining us wow. on this conversation. And and uh, before we get to it, let's first understand what client air is and what it's uh, supposed to solve. Let's start off with uh, David. Okay, clean air. It's supposed to be clean air. Oh, so yeah, it's supposed the, to be the cleaned. Yeah. Oh, okay there. Uh -huh. Okay, so basically clean air is an innovation around indoor air pollution, whereby we are purifying the air indoor areas in homes, schools, hospitals and those offices. Okay, and why do you feel the need to actually put forth this innovation? Climate change has been our passion, so we concentrated on indoor air pollution, especially now during the COVID-19 period because people are most indoors and also uh, we have researched and known that indoor air pollution actually kills three times more than outdoor air and people don't know about that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's the, the one of the passion that's motivating us to solve that, yeah. Okay, and the lady in the room, let's understand how did cleaned air come to be? Okay, um, I'm Caroline Mamoy, we were first to start. And uh, we, we are students from Jaramogi, Ogingo Odinga University of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. We are final years, we just completed our exams. Uh, we met in our first year when we were joining and then we come from uh, the same background. So we were able to come up together and uh, we thought maybe we should come up with a solution because the world is changing, I can tell you for sure, mm -hmm. even with COVID-19. So we thought of a solution, what we can do for indoor, to curb the indoor air pollution. Mm -hmm. And that's how we joined together. And also, Hard Prize came along and gave us a platform to be able to to air our innovation. Okay. Yes. Now, you say you come from uh, the same background. What do you mean? Okay. I mean that uh, most of us come fl from slums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's where we have been raised. Okay. Yeah. And when you say us, it's a team of five who are yes. passionate towards achieving a healthy and clean environment through yes. clean air. Tell me about the other team members. Well, we have... Uh we actually three, uh, two, uh, three gentlemen and two ladies. Mm -hmm. We have Caroline and Patra. Then we have Ken as our CEO and Tony. He's also in another TV show as we speak. So we are from different uh, fields of the of academia. I'm doing computer security, that's cyber security. Caroline is doing uh, environmental and water engineering. Mm -hmm. Same ke to Ken as he's also doing forensics. Tony is doing special needs and Patra is doing uh, spatial planning. So at least we are, we are a team that is well combined from different areas. Mm -hmm met together then decided let's work on this because we are motivated by our own stories and where we come from. Uh -huh. Now Caroline you said you got together in your first year of school so is this innovation four years old or how long have you been in school so far? <laughs> we have been in school for four years right mm -hmm. but uh, thinking of it we have been thinking from our first year what we can do but mm -hmm. it is we started working on it in 2019. 
Aha, uh -huh. yeah. and 2020, yeah. and uh, I mean, COVID is here with us. It sure. actually comes to solve a very critical rule or rather problem. And uh, speaking of which, explain to us how cleaned air works. Wow. Uh, now, this is a device we first started. Uh, we wanted to make an air purifier, mm -hmm. simply that can clean the air using a unique technology and using a unique filter that mm -hmm. is the first of its kind in Africa and also in Kenya. So the first thing, we had two phases. We had to work on the monitor first so that you can monitor the quality of air in your house and tell you the exact metrics guided by the WHO. So the monitor is, is able to tell you this how your air is polluted according to these numbers and you, you can see them. And then now there's the air purifier, mm -hmm. automated now, mm -hmm whereby after a certain level of air pollution is reached, automatically the purifier starts. Uh -huh. And then after the air is now cleaned, mm -hmm. the filter stops. So this is how it works. Uh, you just connect it. And then as long as you are anywhere, uh, your machine is connected to Wi-Fi, you can be able to see okay. your air pollution. So right now it's telling that uh, the levels are severe. We, oui, yeah. our studio is terrible. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so now after it goes, uh, after some time, so it'll go back to normal. So it will continue uh, cleaning that air, cleaning that air until that air is, is good. Mm -hmm. So not unless it goes to the good level, mm -hmm. the fan won't stop, the purifier won't stop. It, okay. it only stops after. Okay. After the AI has been cleaned. Okay, keep of it course. running. We want to see if we can actually salvage the situation in the studio. Okay. And uh, while we wait for that, Caroline, he talks about the metrics according to the WHO. Yeah. What are those? Okay, the WHO recommends that in uh, indoor air pollution should be 50 ppm, mm -hmm. the normal one. But if wait, are we good now? Yes, good. Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So the WHO, as I said, recommends that uh, the normal indoor air, uh, indoor clean air should be 50 ppm. Mm -hmm. But when it rises beyond that, then that area is polluted. Okay. Yeah. So can we switch it off now? Because I think there's a feedback sound. Why is he doing that? Uh, it's only that our fan is running very fast okay. because of the purification. So when it's fast severe, mm. the fan speed actually increases very fast. So that's uh -huh. why you're hearing that sound. Okay. But then as it goes to moderate, uh, the fan stops, uh, goes slowly, and then when it's good, it finally stops. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when it, uh, you can see now, it was moderate before yes. I switched off. Yeah. So that is 149. Mm -hmm. That is uh, dries the recommended uh, ppm by the WHO. Ooh. Ppm means partic uh -huh. particles per million. So yeah. what I'm looking at is 149. And you said the minimum should be 50. 50. So, yeah. yeah, we were doing really badly. Yeah. And, yeah, engineers, please make note of this. We just have been assessed <laughs> and our air in the studio is pretty uh, polluted. And uh, even as you do this, have you been able to come up with something that you can put in the market? Of course, now, this was the first phase that we did. Mm -hmm. First, I told you working on the air monitor because that was the critical part to be able to monitor that air yes. and also know how we are going to purify that. So now we have made now the prototype for the air purifier. We are now remaining with only one part of actually making sure that our filter works uh, very, very well. Mm -hmm. Then after that, now we, we are ready to scale and commercialize. Uh -huh. yeah. Caroline, speaking yeah. of commercializing it, who is financing this? Okay, right now I could say we are just financing ourselves mm -hmm. because we we used uh, our t-shirts as you can see in this okay. t-shirt to yes. fundraise. Uh -huh. So we got uh, around 50 plus to be able to do the prototype but we are asking people and our friends to join us to be able to commercialize this to be able to reach to the market. Uh -huh. yes. And uh, speaking of the uh, challenges that mm -hmm. you have faced along the way in putting okay. this together, which are they? First of all, uh, I'll have to say uh, most of the components are not here in Kenya, so mm -hmm. it's very hard to find. And also the, tec the technical know-how of how to actually connect this and make it work is kind of difficult. Then finance is problem. As we are students, we're also struggling. Mm -hmm. We have to pay our fees, we have to pay our rent and everything, and also make sure that our project runs. And as we speak also, uh, we are representing Kenya and Africa mm -hmm. uh, with the two teams only from Africa at the Hull Price Global Accelerator Program. 
So we won here in Nairobi against 300 and other 50 entrepreneurs, uh -huh. the first kind of the team to win in Nairobi regionals in almost 10 years. Uh -huh. So that was a big up for us. So we are now going for the final prize at the UN headquarters uh -huh. for 1 million USD, if at all we are able to go past the, the, this stage now that we are in now. Aha, yeah. uh -huh. mm. mkipata 1 million USD mumeomoka, for sure. <laughs> that would be it, right? Yeah. Now, Caroline, tell me about uh, a bit more of the challenges. Definitely, you take different uh, units in school. Yeah. The time to even put this together, has that been easy to do? And has the university given you the support you need? Um, I'll say, yes, the university has really helped us. Uh, because uh, being able even to come here, it is through their support and even showcasing this. Mm -hmm. But uh, juggling between education and also innovation yes. is kind of tricky because you have to be in class, but you, it's just a matter of uh, arranging your time well. Uh -huh. yes. And speaking of challenges, local innovators are now calling on the Kenya Bureau of Standards and other regulatory agencies to waive registration and certification fee for their products as they seek for local and cheaper solutions to curb the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Our reporter Gabriel Kudaka caught up with a tailor in Wasangishu County who is making improvised face shields that also double up as masks. Barely a month ago, we visited Richard Rotara, a tailor in Eldoret town who had responded to the need created by COVID-19 pandemic by making reusable masks. But as the number of those infected continues to rise, so does the homemade innovations to help curb its spread. Yo, like Rotara says he and his eight employees can churn out 200 improvised face shields in a day. Rotara says supporting homemade innovations such as his will not only promote local economy but also reduce the government spending. Maybe kutoka ngambo wana wana tuzia 10,000 kwa taktari moja mbaya na utumia mgonjwa. So maybe my new one is new and new also. That will see about almost two thousand. He says he can make a full protective gear for health workers if given a green light. However, approval of his products by the Kenya Bureau of Standards is still a challenge. The Yambi one is registered now on seventy-nine thousand. The Nisipit Kutengenesa is fit to two two hundred thousand. Which means the challenges we are getting to Akali, the cost and even the, lesser, uh, the process of doing registration of innovation and invention. Inspection fee, elufu ishirini. Alafu wameweka certification fee, elufu saba miatano. Alafu tena wameweka VAT, 16%. Mwanainchi wa kawaida kwa saai SME hawezi kupata hii fedha. Gabriel Kudaka, NTV. So the challenge is facing various innovators out there. And I'm wondering, even as you get into the market, are these things that are making you concerned and wondering how you can go about it? Of course. Uh, I love to say actually uh, from our journey, to be an innovator in Kenya, it's like a death sentence. You have to go through a lot, emotional turmoil, uh, financial constraints, mm -hmm. all of that so that you can make your innovation go through. Because uh, we have people supporting the innovations, but not at the scale th like other countries are. Mm -hmm. So you find that uh, most of our uh, the, the venture capitalists that are, are here, they want to support already established startups that have gone to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, forgetting that, actually the most innovative and uh, kind of solution uh, uh, solving uh, in the slums and also in areas that are really needed mm -hmm. where the pains are are actually at the ideation stage mm -hmm. so if, I call, if we can all uh, start by supporting these uh, innovations at the ideation stage and giving them a platform to showcase them and also scale it would be nice for Kenya okay yeah. but speaking of which you said you won uh, a prize with HALT prize Nairobi regionals yeah. well, what exactly is it that they do and how did you come about them okay HAL Prize is a global movement. It gives the students, university students, a platform where they can come up with innovations and air them out. And then they, 
they support them through experts and guiding them from idea mm. to f from a step to step from idea to now to registering a company and then to be uh, to be able to scale and become a company mm. so that's what half price does mm -hmm. yeah. and so far what kind of mentorship have you uh, gotten from them okay we have been able to be mentored through all through from uh, March to April, mm -hmm. we were just an idea. We didn't yeah. even have a prototype. Ah. Yes, uh -huh. so they have mentored us from being just an idea to now being able to come to, to work on our prototype and uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. And uh, are we saying that we do not have these kind of platforms in this country? We do. And actually, we're also in another program very fascinating here in Kenya mm -hmm. at Lake Hub in Kisumu whereby we have also been in the incubation for six months and continuing, mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to end in November. So we have the incubations here in Kenya. The only that, uh, mo so most of, uh, of, of the students and innovative minds don't know about this. Mm -hmm. So we need to also create awareness around the incubation programs in Kenya because they are there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you amalgamate that kind of support from the institution that you attend and the investors that need to walk uh, with you in this journey? Okay, with the with the with the Lake Hub and uh, the Half Price program, mm -hmm. they run separately. But now we are doing them virtually, mm -hmm. so we are able to meet each and every week, uh, maybe every day or maybe three days per week, mm -hmm. virtually. But then uh, on the school, we are also able to actually plan ourselves right to know how when to attend classes, what to do, uh, when to do our assignments and everything. And also uh, because we have we are not yet in that stage whereby investors are, are coming to us. Now that's the step that we are going, calling on investors to come and actually invest in this idea. Because this is not our vision. Mm -hmm. This is just the beginning. Yeah. We want to be able to make an, a, a, a program or maybe a software or an innovation that can be able to detect the COVID-19 in people two meters away. Mm -hmm. So you can just tell by the samples that, uh, to improve our sensors so that they become so powerful that uh, they can test the COVID-19 when you're two meters away and tell you these are the symptoms based on the analysis. These are what you, you, you get. And then be able to now scale using artificial intelligence and internet of things whereby you can be able right now, you see, you can be able to, to see your, uh, your results, mm -hmm. your air quality results wherever you are in the country mm -hmm. as long as the machine is connected to the Wi-Fi or maybe using GSM technology. So Excellent. the vision is wide, but now it's baby steps each and every way. Okay, and we wish you all the best. And Caroline, there's something that you mentioned earlier, that you have the same background, you come from informal settlements. Yeah. Does uh, the need to look into air pollution, uh, did it come from that setting where you saw there was such a huge gap? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, it came from... Uh, because we live in the slums, the air, indoor air, they are so small, the spaces are so small because you are just cooking here, doing your things uh, here, the, the space is small, you mm -hmm. understand? So uh, growing in, in such a place, you, you find that some of the people get allergic to, and they don't know why they are allergic, but with time, they develop even respiratory diseases, but they're not even aware. So we saw that there is really a, uh, there is a wide gap that is, uh, that is there, but no one is talking about it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we came up with this. And yeah. it's not only the informal settlements going by sure. your description. We're talking yeah. even about the rural areas yes. where the setup is very similar. Yes. So are you looking into working with the county governments to reach as many people as you can when it comes to it? Of course, actually, we have started co actually co contacting the county government, different county governments. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are still yet to, to get replies, but we intend to have a campaign on indoor air pollution. As we have said, indoor air pollution is a menace in this country, mm -hmm. and you find that uh, close to all, almost half of the children nowadays, they are either allergic, they are asthmatic, or they, ha they have one or two respiratory diseases, mm -hmm. but the cause is unknown. Mm -hmm. But we, we are now trying to tackle that by introducing now the awareness on indoor air pollution because it's really a mess. And uh, we are projecting maybe in the next 15 years we'll have a cancer vaccination because once the respiratory disease comes in, mm -hmm. then you are, uh, the, your chest becomes weak and you're able now to actually invite so many other diseases in your body. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are headed now by actually making a campaign, a, a, a whole month word, uh, campaign for indoor air pollution to be able to solve these things. Because uh, as I've said, so many people know so much about outdoor air, 
but on the indoor air, nobody is talking about mm -hmm. that. We are just used to the pollution. Like now, you may say, like in this station, you are not aware of the levels of uh, pollution in, in oh, here. No. But you are, you are so used to that uh, until it's in your normal. It's the new normal. And so, you wonder yeah. why you're yeah. always sneezing and of coughing course. when you get into the studio. Yeah. Uh -huh. So these are the kind of uh, things that we are trying to actually to solve. Mm -hmm. Because the pains at, uh, at, at, the, at the level that you are in, whether it's the rule or the, uh, the slums or, or the, the, the good uh, estates and everything, mm -hmm. The level is people don't know about indoor air pollution mm -hmm. and it's killing them. You, you find that 14,000 people die yearly here in Kenya because of indoor air pollution. And that is data way back from 2009. We are now wow. in 2020. It now must imagine be worse. the gap. Uh -huh. And now COVID 19 came along. Mm -hmm. you, you may never know mm -hmm. what kind of numbers we speak about. So you find that 4.8 million people die yearly. On the, in the world because of indoor air pollution. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something we need to talk about. Because now this is eating up on the economy and the productivity of people. Because if at all you will have to come to your job while you are sick because of something that you don't know is causing that, then your productivity even on your home becomes very little. Yeah. The same uh, appears to the school and uh, there's research being done actually between the relationship between now uh, the uh, IQ level and indoor air pollution. Mm -hmm. Because now once the, 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 the pollutants get into your body, it actually affects your brain. So you are, you are, you are, you are now, you are, your IQ level goes down. Uh -huh. So this, the, it's a long research we have to do. And also something else, we're also targeting to do a research on the causes of death in, uh, in the rural areas. Because so many people use firewood. Yeah. Yes, we don't want to, to them to migrate from the firewood just yet because it's going to take a long time. But now we need to tell them, okay, here, you can go ahead and use your firewood, but we have our air purifier here, which can be able to purify that air. As you're using your firewood, we make sure that your health is right and you're able to actually continue their, their life. Yeah, uh -huh. optimally, okay. Yes. Now, Caroline, seeing that we are focusing on the informal settlements, the rural areas or setups, do you think when your prototype goes into the market, it will be affordable to this cadre of people? Yes, we will make sure that our air purifiers are affordable to everyone. That is what we are working towards. If we can be able to commercialize this at a, at a large scale, with the, 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 the cost of production will actually go lower and we'll be able to sell our air purifiers between $15 to $20, which will be affordable to everyone. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Thank and uh, we continue with this conversation, but let's catch up with another innovator. A young man in Thika, Kiambu County, has turned his passion into a business opportunity. Martin Wahome has been driven to support people with disabilities with equipment to make them mobile. Now he hopes his new venture will enable him to earn a living and still support those in need of physical and financial assistance. Leila Mohammed has more. Martin Wahome checks if all the parts of a motorized wheelchair that he made are working smoothly before his client picks it up. He assembled the electric wheelchair at his home in Makongeni village in Thika of Kiambu County and made it using locally sourced materials. <laughs> In order to make his creations affordable to those who need them, the father of two says he hardly uses imported materials and that if well utilized, locally available parts such as bicycle parts, sponges, are more durable. He says that his first invention of electric chairs, which are powered by locally available lithium-ion batteries, can maneuver indoors with ease, saying he has incorporated farm technology to support the mobility of the equipment. The self-taught innovator says Kenya has since the onset of COVID-19 rediscovered its potential in terms of innovation, saying that if innovators are well supported, the country can mass produce every item used locally. Data from Global Disability Rights, an international resource center for persons with disabilities, indicates that at least 1.16 million Kenyans have mobility-related disabilities, 
and more than half of them live in rural areas. These are the people that Wahome intends to reach through massive production of the mobility equipment which he says will not only ease their movements but will also enable them to engage in effective nation building. Leila Mohamed, NTV. We clearly have the brains right here. All they need is the support and will be able to be self-sufficient. Still in studio with uh, David Ngamau, who is a chief tec technical officer at Cleaned Air, Air and Caroline Wamoyo, CFO at Cleaned Air. And David, you, I see plastic, I see wires. At the end of the day, what does the real deal look like? What will it be made of? Well, I was waiting for that. Thank you for your question. So uh, we are going actually environmental friendly all the way. Mm -hmm. So this is just, uh, we just use the, the plastic because that was what we could use locally and it was a waste. So we, we reused that for also to be economic, uh, environmental friendly. But we intend to use bamboo in our casing because bamboo first uh, releases 30% uh, more oxygen to the air. So that I will use that as a casing so that we don't have to actually carry a lot of plastics wherever we are and we don't pollute the environment as we also manufacture that. Mm -hmm. We also in, uh, intend to also uh, call upon bamboo farmers uh, to uh, actually come and partner with us so that because we have a program of planting bamboo, almost a million, meal, a million trees maybe in the next five to six years. Mm -hmm. And we are also calling on support in any, anybody who can actually come and join our venture and program to help us and support us in doing that. So mm -hmm. first of all, we are going to change all this to bamboo. So we're doing everything on bamboo. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, now I see wires meaning that uh, we are going electrical with okay. this, yeah. but with the people we are actually targeting, mm -hmm. some of them do not or are not connected to the electric grid. Uh -huh. Is there an option for a battery? Probably, yes, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, when the final product is now on, uh, we'll have both, uh, we have all the alternatives of uh, using either solar panel, maybe a battery, or maybe electricity, depending on which, uh, which area any, anyone is and the kind of pollution, because the devices will be different for each and specific areas. Like now in Sokima, you need a very powerful air, fill, air purifier, purifier because of the kind of levels near the industries and everything. Uh -huh. But now in the rural areas, you, you only need to, to remove a certain of uh, pollutants uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the air. So now we are going to actually incorporate both the AC and DC type of current so that anybody anywhere in Kenya whether you have electricity or not whether you have a solar panel or whether you don't have you maybe you can have an inbuilt bit, uh, battery whereby you can recharge it and then uh, purify that air mm -hmm. and for example now we are uh, projecting our air purifier to actually uh, uh, clean 16.8 tons of air in an hour so oh. that's a lot of impact here yeah. Okay. yeah expanding that to now employing our youth because right now we, we are five employing ourselves we need to create jobs for ourselves as youth Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Caroline, uh, David is uh, mentioning Siokimau, and I'm sure there are other areas that you've probably done your research to mm -hmm. understand the need. Which are these other areas that have a red flag on them? I can say um, like Webuya. Webuya is really polluted. And also even Nairobi, mm -hmm. Nairobi where we stay is mm -hmm. really polluted. And also I would say in Kisumu there are parts that are really polluted. So we'll focus on that first. Okay, so yeah. are we keeping our eye around the industrial sites? Uh, also? For us that. Yeah. For us that, we shall do that. Okay. Yes. All right, now tell me, guys, I mean, this has been an amazing journey, and uh, we pray that you actually get the support you need to take it to the next level. What have you learned about yourself, David, through this whole process? Wow, it's a lot. It's huge, actually. Some of the qualities, me personally, as an individual, I never knew about myself, mm -hmm. actually came to know while I'm in Team Clindia because we teach each other, actually, and we help each other grow. For example, the patients, actually, the teamwork. Uh, I've been able actually to become a campus director in Joramogi and then later on become an ambassador for Kenya Health Phase and then now I, I switch that now to concentrate on clean full time. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long of journey as challenges and everything but every time we just come, or come back bouncing because uh, the passion and the vision that you have keeps you going no matter what comes in the way. Uh -huh. yeah. And for you Caroline? Well, I would say I've learned a lot from this journey. First of all I will just echo my, my colleague here having patience because if you don't have patience in Kenya while you are innovating, then uh, you'll not go anywhere. <laughs> I can tell you for sure. I've yeah. also learned to be confident about my, uh, what I'm doing. I can tell you for sure, Gladys, there is a lot of crazy ideas out there, but people don't talk about them because maybe they feel they, can, they, they won't be listened. 
but I've learned to be confident and shout out to my dear to everyone that I come across. And also, yes, I also reaching out to people has really helped me to be able to be more talkative. I'm less talkative in the group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I think a, I could pick that up yes, sure. <laughs> from the two of you, but uh, you've done well. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking, about, speaking about your ideas, there are many others that I'm sure that are within your institution of okay. higher learning. Mm -hmm. So how is uh, Jaramogi as an institution okay enabling other innovators to bring the ideas to life? Okay, we, we, we have, we have we, uh, Just is actually encouraging students through the clubs now because they can deal with the directly. We have to be on an organized platform so that we can be able to be supported. So there's the Half Price Club and there's also the Natas Club, and other clubs in the school whereby innovations are actually nurtured and help to grow so that when opportunities for competing and getting money and funds come along, students are called upon, come with their innovation, do something, on this, they're supported all through through the search and everything until they're able now to come into television and say, This is what we have done, and this is where we are going. But now we are here, we need to get there. Yes. Uh -huh. Caroline, the how to prize uh, representation in Africa is coming up, or has it already happened? Pardon? Has uh, you said you're representing Africa, yes, yeah, so has this already happened? Uh, we are still on the journey. Uh -huh. As we said, Hull Prize is uh -huh. a program that is running virtually uh -huh. right now. So we are still in the program. Uh -huh. We will be, actually, we have been invited in the UK around December. Uh -huh. If COVID, that is, <laughs> if they, there will be no COVID. Uh -huh. So it's still continuing and it will end around in January. So that's when we'll be visiting the UK, uh, the UK to be able to demonstrate uh, physically our idea. Okay, yes. and uh, how does it feel to be part and parcel of something that incorporates other amazing minds around the world? Actually, it's amazing. You find out that uh, you, you are not the only students who are innovators. There are so many people who are outside there innovating. So it's amazing. It's an amazing journey. Okay, if it was up to you, what would be an ideal situation for an innovator in this country? First of all, it's point blank. It's, I'm going to be very straight with you. Yes. The fans and the networks, networks to organizations and people who believe in that same cause. Because you may give me money, but if you don't believe in what I believe in, then I don't think we are going far. But if you believe in what I'm doing, even if I get that little money, we are able to scale that and do the impact that is needed. Because right now, businesses, it's all about impact. It's, it's about impact and making good. As you can see in our website, we say, for good, for profit. So we are able to make good while mm -hmm. at the same time making profit out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Caroline, do you think innovation is the answer for the number of jobless youth we see in this country? Absolutely, absolutely. If we could be able in, uh, while you are coming out of the universities, you, you are supported through your innovation, mm -hmm. then we could create employment for our youths. Because uh, coming out of the university, just having a degree, then you tarmac for a very long time looking for a job. If only these people, we could create employment uh, through our companies that we have innovated, then mm -hmm. Job employment, a, a lack of employment could not be an issue in this country. Uh -huh. sure. Now they say too many cooks can spoil the broth. You guys are five of you. How do you ensure that this teamwork keeps going and keeping the idea alive? That's the perfect team, actually. Because once uh, they say, the, the, the wise men say, if you want to work fast, you work alone. But if you want to go far, mm -hmm. you work as a team. So we are a team of five from different specific areas of academia, with each and every one having skills that are able to support us. For example, like me doing technology, uh, I'm a talkative person, so I, I, I enjoy fun. I actually. think we can tell yeah, that. <laughs> so Caroline, she's our mom in the team, so yes. she's able to cool everyone off when the heads are high. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenaz is the, is the CEO, and uh, he's able now to actually collect the team together and give us the vision that we need. Uh, Tony the, uh, does special needs, so he's able to work on our uh, psychological needs, wherever the team is actually blazing up in fire 
by the bottle come us down and tell us wow guys we need to do this let's go out and have fun okay and then now patra we have patra doing special planning yeah. she's our queen and uh, she, uh, she's actually our princess mm -hmm. so she help us uh, make jokes and have fun she's our tiktok lady <laughs> uh, the ambassador and marketing team so she's able to incorporate the team together we are like now we are friends who turned family uh, and uh, we, we think we are now past the family level because uh, we are now so much conducting to each other that we, I can't sleep without knowing how Caro is doing. She can't mm -hmm. sleep without knowing how Patra is doing. Patra can't sleep without knowing how Kenaz is doing. Mm -hmm. And this all has, has become because of the innovation and the love we have, appreciating each and every one uh, areas uh, of strength because we also have our weaknesses. But now my weakness is her strength. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we com we, we uh, complement each other that way. Okay, yeah. but uh, you are human beings. Are there moments during this journey where you felt like, okay, fine, we've done our best, Kime Umana, let's just move on to something else, Caroline? Yes, yes, yes. Gladys, I could go when I say it. We fight. We do fight as a team because. We are not perfect, as you said, so we fight, but at the end of the day, we just look back. We have come from so far to just quit on this, so we keep pushing and also praying. Praying mm -hmm. helps us uh, come together mm -hmm. a, a lot of times here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and uh, I would like you to speak to other innovators out there who are really trying to penetrate into the market and are facing the same challenges or even more challenges that uh, you have come across. Where does somebody find their footing, David? First of all, uh, the, the, the first step uh, as an innovator, wherever you are, whether in Kenya or anywhere else, whether you have the, the, the kind of support you need or not yet, it's first believing in yourself no matter what. Even if your idea is as crappy as it seems mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, don't quit on yourself. Believe in yourself and have that passion. Don't just look at the, at the, at the present uh, issues and uh, uh, the challenges that are facing you. Look at the vision that you want to have. Mm -hmm. Also look at the impact you want to make to the community and also the world at large. So uh, the first step is believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. The next step, do something about it. No matter how little it is, for us now it's the plastic, but now the next time we come here it will be a fully furnished device working and purifying that air alive as we speak. Mm -hmm. Understand? So do something about it. Even if it's little steps, one by one, just make sure that every day you do something positive towards your innovation and never quit knocking doors. We have actually emailed so many organizations I can't even keep, keep, keep count of the numbers. Yeah. So it's been that, no replies and we keep going, some replies and they say, oh right now we, are, we, are, we don't have the money but we support you now. And that support, that, that that kind of support is actually very encouraging. Mm -hmm. So I would tell you, uh, look for also for a circle, for a team that will be able to actually complement you and help you grow. Because uh, another thing I felt uh, in a team also, because we are, have been mentoring also innovative uh, mm -hmm. students now from Jaramogi, is that uh, most of the people that you work on are able to determine where you're going. Some people will really discourage you and you will end up giving on yourself. Yeah. But now if you find just one person or two person will be able to tell you, ah, I think it's challenging, but I, I'm, I'm willing to actually go ahead and do this. Yeah. It's okay, we can just take a risk and go on. Mm -hmm. So why not take a risk, see what is going on. It's better to have done something and uh, failed rather than not to have done something at all and regret. Yeah. Very well mm -hmm. said. And Caroline, what is the space for mentorship in this journey? What is the role and value of the same? I think uh, if you come up with an idea or uh, innovation, there's a lot of people who are willing to support. It's just that you have to talk about it. If you keep quiet, then nobody will, uh, will do anything about it. So if you are able to talk, then people are able to come and nurture you. Yes. Okay, and we're living in the day and age where technology has made us a global village, literally. Has this something, or has this been something that has catapulted your idea to the world? Of course, now because we are using technology, I've said internet of things, whereby you can be able to control your house maybe, or control the, the, the air filter, wherever you are, whether you're in Mombasa and your home is in Kisumu, you can be able to control it online as long as there's data and connectivity. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, we are going towards the, the big data stage, whereby data is now controlling almost all, all our activities. Uh -huh. So you'll be able to know which kind of areas in Kenya are most polluted and the reasons why that pollution is coming on. Then we are going to the vehicle industry, whereby we can be able to tap that pollution right from 
the exhaust pipe of the vehicle and actually clean that before it is released to the environment. Okay. And also purify inside the vehicle now so that people who are in, they can be able to breathe fresh air. Yeah. Okay, mm. that is David Ngabao, Chief Technical Officer, Cleaned Air, and Caroline Wamoyo, Chief Finance Officer at Cleaned Air. We wish you all the best. And as you said, the next time you shall have the real deal with the bamboos and all, and we'll be able to see how best it works for us. Again, thank you for your time, and we wish you all the best. And as I mentioned earlier today, we're focusing on on technology and innovation and of course the same happening especially in the uh, vicinity of uh, higher institutions of higher education and speaking of which we shall be looking at the status of the same right after this short break stay with us Forgive me. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja and in this hour we shall be focusing on the third biennial conference on the status of higher education in Kenya. To help us walk this talk in studio, Professor Jackson Toll, who is the head of planning, research and development at the Commission for University Education. And next to him is Professor Chacha Nyegoti Chacha, who is the chairman of the board at the Commission for University Education. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. But before we get to that, education conversation let's focus on something that everyone is uh, expecting to see in full light and clamor even as we focus on the bbi official report being unveiled at the bombers of kenya president uru kenyatta and odm party leader Raila Odinga will unveil that bbi uh, report to the public at the bombers of kenya from 10 a.m this morning and definitely ntv is keeping its eye on the same even as we focus on the outcome of the day. That should be starting off from 9 a.m. And speaking of which, this uh, people have been reacting uh, to the BBI report. Remember, this is something that was handed over to the two leaders last week in Kisi. And we are now joined by my colleague Kevin Mutai from Mombasa to give us some of those reactions coming from that region. Kevin? Well, good morning, Gladys. Indeed, it's a big day that Kenyans have been waiting for. They're looking forward to seeing the BBI report launched officially by President Uhuru Kenyatta together with the former Prime Minister Raila Odinga at the Bombers of Kenya. Remember, the coastal region is one of the regions in the country that had their own recommendations and resolutions with regard to the Building Bridges Initiative. And uh, during the BBI rally in early this year, the leaders from this particular region presented more than 15 resolutions to uh, former Prime Minister Raila Odinga at a rally in Mamangina here in Mombasa, where among the key issues raised was to make sure that uh, the leaders from the region must be included in the top government positions as well as uh, 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 sorting out the issues related to land injustices proposing to the government to buy uh, owners from absent to buy land from absent, absentee uh, landlords so as to address that particular issue and of course also there's the issue of uh, uh, coming up with an economic stimulus package to uh, 
such as to, to, to promote uh, key areas such as the port operations, uh, the tourism industry, as well as the blue economy, uh, among many other issues that perhaps the leaders and the coastal residents came together and presented these particular recommendations. And they are looking forward to see if at all uh, or, or, or some of these key issues they raised will be included in the final report of the Building Bridges Initiative. But quickly, let me just uh, review some of the views from uh, the residents here to just get a glimpse of their thoughts about uh, today's event and, of course, uh, their uh, proposals uh, with regards to the BBR. Please kindly introduce yourself and just uh, give us your reactions uh, about uh, the Building Bridges Initiative. Yes, uh, my name is Osumba Hesbonoyo. My name is... No, no, please put on your mask. My name is Osumba Hesbonoyo. Mm -hmm. I'm a resident of Mombasa here and I represent the youth's uh, views uh, in Mombasa. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we are set to unveil uh, the new set of the uh, BBI proposal, mm -hmm. um, some of the issues uh, regarding our youths have uh, attracted my attention. Mm -hmm. And this is why I want to indulge mm -hmm. on matters youths as regards to the BBI. Mm -hmm. And the reason as why I still have questions uh, on uh, whether the BBI is going to tackle uh, the issue of youths uh, amicably as we expected or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it today, uh, uh, what has uh, drawn my attention is uh, in the BBI, we as youths, uh, as you can see uh, and as you can read from the document, we are only uh, assumed as the dustbin in this nation, mm -hmm. whereby we are given uh, packages that are not meant uh, to address serious issues and challenges regarding uh, the youths themselves. Mm -hmm. One being uh, youths are now being given a tax holiday in this BBI. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trying to ask myself whether mm -hmm. are we going to address the challenges uh, um, in youths? Um, uh, with so what, is, what, what are your thoughts about the document? The are you for it or against it? I'm against the document simply because it is not addressing the challenges that are facing. Please put on your mask, well. Mm -hmm. It is not addressing the challenges facing the youths. Mm -hmm. uh, like just as I've said, uh, tax holidays mm -hmm. is only should only be channeled to the aged, uh, aged individuals like mm -hmm. uh, who have uh, grabbed the money from this uh, government and has enough capital to start off business for themselves. Mm -hmm. Youths, you can't... How about the leadership positions? The leadership positions... Youths, as youths, we agitate for those positions. Mm -hmm. We don't agitate... We, we don't... Uh, we don't uh, preferably uh, aim to be given a tax holiday, whereas we don't have even capital to run those businesses. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Gladys, let me just quickly get one more person before I hand it over back to you. Tafadhali kwa kifupi tu majina yako alafu unipe kauli yako kutoka na ripoti ya BBI ambayo inazinduliwa leo rasmi na Rais Uhuru Kenyatta pamoja na aliyekuwa waziri mkuu Raila Odinga kule Bomas eh, Nairobi. Yes kwa majina ninaitwa Jared Otieno. Mimi ni kwa maoni yangu kwa BBI nimeona kama sisi kama watu walio na walemavu we are well represented there kwa sababu hii document ni kubwa bado tulisoma sote kwa sababu kwa vile tunaona hii kitu ni mzuri kwa sababu sisi kama wakati post election kama election wise zinakuja ile post election violence one mbaya kwa watu wanaishi na walemavu yeah asante uh, well glad is indeed it is a very uh, huge topic that will be engaging different uh, locals from uh, county of mombasa as well as uh, leaders and key stakeholders and uh, the professionals working in different in both private and at the public sector and we'll be able to review all their views with regards uh, to the Building Bridges Initiative and we'll definitely have a very informative uh, uh, detailed story with regards to uh, the report uh, from the coastal region. Back to you Gladys. Thank you, Kevin Mutai, coming to us from Mombasa County with the reactions of that or to that BBI report that will be officially unveiled to the public at the Bombers of Kenya. This will be led by President Uhuru Kenyatta and ODM party leader Raila Odinga. Remember, the two received the report last week at the new Kisi State Lodge where they urged Kenyans to carefully read the report in order to enable them to make informed choices. Now, that report continues to arouse 
caused debate across the country, different leaders giving their varying opinions about it, and we shall be capturing some of those opinions even as we come to you live from uh, the Bombers of Kenya from uh, 9 a.m. But back to the conversation for this hour, and it's one that is focused on something that's coming up this week, Wednesday and Thursday, the third biannual conference on the status of higher education in Kenya. As I mentioned earlier, we're joined to have that conversation by Professor Jackson Toh, who is the head of planning, research, and development at the Commission for University Education, and Professor Chacha Nyegoti Chacha, who is the chairman uh, of the board that is at the Commission for University Education. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Now, as we said, we are looking forward to this on Wednesday and Thursday. Who are the organizers of the same? Let me start with Professor Toh. Thank you very much, Gladys. Uh, first, I want to thank NTV for giving us this forum to engage with the stakeholders and participants who we expect to join us on Wednesday and Thursday. Now, we have organized this uh, conference, the Commission for University Education, the management staff and the board were in the forefront in organizing this conference. It is a premier event for the commission uh, and it takes place every two years. And so uh, the, the board of management, uh, the staff and the stakeholders have been behind this uh, conference that we are looking forward to having on Wednesday. Okay. And uh, Professor Chacha, why now? Why has uh, this come at a time where the world is focusing on the pandemic? Why continue with the same? I think uh, we normally have this conference every two years. Mm -hmm. But uh, this year, as uh, all of us know, we have been confronted by a number of challenges because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Resulting from that, that's how we are now focusing on the preparation and uh, the state of the art by universities put in place to mitigate the challenges which have been caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that uh, during this conference, will be able to get the information from the various universities which will participate about what challenges they have faced, what preparations they have put in place, and what strategies they're going to be applying uh, now and perhaps for the future. Mm -hmm. Because this pandemic has opened a new opportunity mm -hmm. pathway for universities to examine themselves in terms of uh, how they have uh, applied uh, technological uh, uh, advancement, mm -hmm. which is all over now in the institutions, to render and offer the same education which was being rendered uh -huh. in class. Okay. And speaking of which, how's the, how has the pandemic disrupted the consumption of higher education, Professor Toh? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like uh, any other disruption that comes upon uh, humanity, this pandemic has disrupted learning at the university. As you are all aware uh, that in the university, much of the teaching is face-to-face, -face, where the lecturer meets students in a typical lecture hall. And with the impact of the COVID that uh, demands that we keep social distancing and avoid shaking hands and all other uh, uh, situations where we interact closely, meant that students had to stay home. The university had to be closed, and it was from there that alternative ways of uh, delivering learning had to be thought about. So in brief, um, this pandemic has had the impact of making our institutions close down. Mm -hmm. And it is from there that it has triggered uh, measures that we need to ensure that there's continuity of learning in spite of this uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that is why this conference comes in handy to share those experiences uh, with experts and other stakeholders on the initiatives that have been taken by the university and also borrowing from the best practices uh, elsewhere in the world to see that uh, there is uh, continued learning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, Professor Chacha, we talk about the disruption. From your assessment, have universities adjusted accordingly, both from the teaching perspective and from the students' perspective? Uh, they have tried. A number of them have challenges that are, they are still grappling with. But uh, we have been interacting with them 
from our position as the regulator of this sector. And uh, we think that uh, many universities have just been able to discover that uh, they had uh, a lot of potential mm -hmm. in offering uh, uh, programs, academic programs, virtually to the students uh, than they knew before. And I think this has opened, as I said earlier, a uh, new pathway as to how the universities will be conducting business. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, during this conference we share, we'll be also providing some guidance from our protocol of regulations, how the commission has positioned itself to ensure that this uh, mode of offering does not compromise the quality of university education as emphasized. And uh, speaking of which, has, how has technology impacted the delivery of crucial skills in higher institutions of learning, Professor Tong? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Gladys. I think uh, technology generally, by and large, has this effect of disrupting li lives. And technology is good and at the same time uh, scaring and also requires um, users to be competent in skills of how to use it. Uh, what has been apparent is that much as we celebrate technology, mm -hmm. it demands of us to have some basic skills of using it in order to make it, to make you to be effective use of technology. Now what has emerged is that among the faculty, uh, a number of them may not have the requisite skills to be able to uptake and integrate technology. Uh, for example, uh, incidences where one has to establish an account, establish credentials, and develop materials and make them in the format of online delivery requires skill. And that is why the chair said that uh, it is important that we build the capacity of the staff, of students, and other users so that they can actually effectively uh, employ and deploy technology and deliver. Uh, material in the best way uh, possible. Allow me to also emphasize that uh, the quality is the essence and indeed at the Commission we say that quality is our main agenda. It is possible that uh, sometimes we might use technology and lose sight of the critical, critical ingredients of quality and that is why the Commission has been working with uh, stakeholders both uh, locally and outside the country to come up with protocols and frameworks that will guide a uh, delivery of content mm -hmm. at the university. Professor Chacha, what measures should the institutions put in place to ensure that online learning and assessments are not inferior alternatives to the face-to-face -face mode of learning? I think one, they must uh, understand that uh, the basic uh, expected uh, uh, situation in a university is where lecturers meet their students in yes. their classes and in their laboratories, in their workshops. So we should not lose that sight of that. But at the same time, it is important to note that in order to ensure that you don't lose on time because of the challenges of pandemic, you institutionalize alternative modes of how you deliver the, 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 your academic programs. Mm -hmm. This alternative mode is not taking over. I think it's important for us to emphasize that we are not telling the universities that now because of the challenges of pandemic and because we have been exposed to the new mode of delivery through technology, you can abandon uh, the classrooms, you can abandon everything you used to do as a university and start uh, teaching online. Because online, has, uh, online teaching has also its own challenges, one of which is the capacity of the receiver of the learning to actually receive. Because uh, if uh, you're doing a virtual teaching, the students will be scattered all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are not sure that uh, by the time you are teaching, all the students are able to hook up on you, uh, your delivery, mm -hmm. so that they are able to follow you up. And uh, we know that uh, in this country, for example, there are some areas where electricity disruption is rampant. And you might think that uh, students are learning, but at that time, they have no electrical or electricity connection mm -hmm. or connectivity. 
And so it's important for us as we develop uh, this channel and uh, this mode of delivery to take note of the fact that we will require a lot of partnerships from uh, various other players, not necessarily those who teach or those who are involved in the day-to-day -day activities in the universities, but uh, also those who can facilitate the application of technological gadgets. Mm -hmm. And how has the disruption enabled skill and information sharing across various institutions of learning in the country and perhaps even around the globe, Professor To? Yeah, thank you. That uh, the disruption has awakened uh, the capacity available in the country and outside to tap on this technology to ensure that there is learning going on. And uh, I want to say that uh, through technology, we have been able to use uh, various platforms that are available uh, that has enabled uh, we in the commission and the university uh, through, say, Zoom platforms and other different formats for the uh, stakeholders and the experts to engage and share the experiences. So. Um, the pandemic, in a way, so to speak, has been a blessing in the sense that we've been able to reach out mm -hmm. and we've been able to tap onto expertise that is not just resident in, in the country, but outside. And they have been very generous to provide uh, formats that have all along been there, but have never been exploited. Even the university in particular, have had this technology, but uh, there hasn't, there hasn't been a force that made them to quickly uh, tap into it. But uh, the disruption that has come meant that uh, we had to recall all that we had, even in the university. We have had faculty who are experts in the development of uh, uh, online programs. We have had sessions with them, especially when we developed a tool that is going to guide universities in developing or transiting their programs from the face-to-face -face format mm -hmm. into an online format so that there is uniformity across the institutions when they are developing programs for use by, by the universities. And this, this uh, guideline has borrowed heavily from the best practices that are there in, across the globe. Uh -huh. yeah. And speaking of uh, the silver lining of the pandemic, does the advent of technology equalize access to higher education for students from all walks of life, Professor Chate? Yeah, I think to a certain extent when you look at uh, how you can reach the students uh, through technology, uh, the students will be able to, 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 to learn uh, the same things. But uh, as I said earlier, I think the challenge we have is that uh, we need to survey where the location, the actual physical location, of the students when we are now imagining that we are offering them the, the education through online. Uh, where are they and where they are located? Uh, what capacity does that area provide in terms of ensuring that uh, one is not left behind? Because this can also cause a lot of uh, problems. If uh, I am the professor, I'm in Nairobi, electricity is available to me. I'm assuming I'm reaching out to all students wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And perhaps 50% of my students are uh, still struggling to find a way of how they can uh, uh, ensure their phones, are, if they're using smartphones, mm -hmm. their phones are okay. Or if they are not okay, is there electricity? Maybe last night, the whole of 12 hours, there was no power in the vicinity. And therefore, I'm assuming they're on. And since I'm able also perhaps to see that they're on, there is also another challenge that one can be seen as being on, and then he walks away. <laughs> so I will have taken note of the fact that I am now reaching out to 100 students. But maybe midway, as I'm working or teaching or lecturing, 50% uh, of my students just disappear mm -hmm. from the system. So it's important for us to say this is a good opportunity, but uh, we need to harness it. We need to ensure that, first of all, as the Commission for University Education, 
we put uh, regulation protocols to ensure the, that when a university is applying this mode of delivery, it is not just uh, delivery, but it is delivery that can be monitored and it can be evaluated. And also, the, material that, uh, the materials that the lecturers are, are going to be delivering or using to deliver their lectures or their dis discussions with the students must also be moderated. And I think this is where now the Commission for University Education comes in, in terms of ensuring that we bring on board a number of other partners who can support this system, including the IT specialists uh, who may be called upon mm -hmm. to evaluate the materials that have been developed and to see that these materials can indeed be delivered through the online delivery. Okay, now we take a short break on your world. When we come back, we continue with our conversation on the third biennial conference on the status of higher education in Kenya. Now, one of the concerns has been about the fee structures in universities, even as we go into the new COVID era of education. How does this look like for the students and how do the institutions stay afloat? We'll talk about that in a moment. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja. Before we get back to that conversation focused on the third biennial conference on the status of higher education in Kenya, let's cross over to get some of the reactions to that Building Bridges Initiative report that is set to be formally unveiled to the public this morning at the Bombers of Kenya as the debate on the clamor to the amend the 2010 Constitution gathers momentum. Now remember the unveiling of the report followed its presentation to President Uru Kenyatta and uh, Railo Dinga at the Kisi State Lodge last Wednesday and the country's second-in-command Deputy President Ruto was not there. Why? That is still out in the, for the jury but a lot of reactions coming out from the same and uh, we are now joined by my colleagues from across the country. We have Kennedy Morethi joining us from the Bombers of Kenya, Oko Kusa from Kisumu County and Bridget Ngana from Nakuru County. We'll start off from where the heat is clearly on and that is at the Bombers of Kenya. Kennedy Morethi, what can you tell us? A very good morning to you, Gladys, there in studio. This is that day where political reporters have to come out in their Sunday best and it is one of those days that we look forward to in the political calendar. You know that the politics of this country actually drives so many things and here at the Bombers of Kenya we do expect to hear some political statements that are going to shape how the days going forward are going to be in the political world as this building bridges or the building bridges initiative report is actually going to be a center point a talk point for most people moving forward and it is actually going to be used as a yardstick for the 2022 elections so what do we expect here today we do expect that president uhuru kenyatta will be arriving here at around 10 o'clock between 10 and 10 30 o'clock and that will have been preceded by the entry of former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, who is his core principal in the matters BBI, and also Deputy President William Ruto, whom, according to yesterday when we were here, all indications were that he was supposed to come here today. There were some rumors that he might not have been invited, but there are those who are saying that there is no way that the Deputy President could not have been invited to such a function. You know, they are also trying to rate what is going to happen this year and what happened last year because there was a bit of confusion. And there are those uh, Deputy President William Ruto lieutenants who said that the function had been hijacked by, Prime, uh, by former Prime Minister Raila Odinga's allies. What do we expect here today is something that we can only wait to see. One of the things that has been actually kept very secretive is the fact of who is going to be the MC and all those questions that we've not been able to realize until now. Yesterday evening, after our story went on air, there are some members of parliament who are calling us and they were saying that they have not received invitation cards to this particular function. Those that we have seen right now are not so many because this hall that is just behind me is very, very, the people who are going in there have a specific 
invitation card. Everybody else is going to be in the tents that are on my left side. So whatever is happening here, we are going to be keeping tabs just to know what is going to happen because President Uru Kenyatta has been very categorical that he wants everybody to read this document for themselves so that they can be able to deduce what they want to deduce. But today, there are some experts who are going to be given an opportunity just to expound on what is in that particular document so that Kenyans are able to understand what is going on and what is it in it for them. I can see some cars on my Oh, on my far end coming, I do not know whether there is a VIP coming, but we are keeping tabs and we'll be giving you information when and when we do receive because we are keeping tabs here until the function ends later in the day. But right now, it's back to you, Gladys, in studio. Thank you, Kennedy Moriti, coming to us from the Bombers of Kenya. Remember, we'll be coming to you live from the same venue even as we take part in that official launch of the BBI report to the public. Let's now cross over to Nakuru County. Bridget Ngana now joins us. Bridget? It's a very cloudy morning here in Nakuru County, but it is heating up with all eyes at the Bombers of Kenya, where the launch of the BBI report will be taking place in the course of the day. Key issues coming from the heart of the country are issues to do with national ethos, meaning a unified form of values for this country. Land is one of the things people in Nakuru are looking at being seen, um, being highlighted in this report. But to speak with the people just briefly, because I do understand we'll go ham in from nine o'clock. Let me just speak to one of the residents here in Nakuru County to just understand what they feel about the report. Welcome, start by your names and tell us what you feel about this report and what it makes sense to you. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to wish the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Huru Kenyatta, a happy birthday. And may God bless you uh, in all your endeavors, Mr. President. Uh, uh, with, with regards to the BBI, I think, uh, first of all, uh, as a county, we're grateful that the, the, the BBI report has finally come out. Yeah. Uh, secondly, it, it addresses, upon re the, the review that we've done, I've seen personally, it addresses some of the issues and key elements that we have continuously neglected. Mm -hmm. For instance, the prompt payment bill. Uh, many a times you, you get, as a business person, you do business with the government or, or, or relevant bodies, and uh, your payments are very, very much delayed. So that's one of the issues. If BBA can tackle that, it will, it will really assist. Uh, the other issue is also, uh, when it regards to the youth, is the issue of uh, help. Now, giving uh, young guys who've left the campus four-year uh, break before they start repaying, I think will take the country a long way. And you know the youth are our future. Yes. Then it also addresses the issue of small and micro, uh, micro and small enterprises bill, which states that they, they, they should, they require, they will actually be getting a seven-year tax break, mm -hmm. and uh, also they'll be allowed to venture more into the government contracts. Mm -hmm. That is a very key issue. Uh, based on the fact that we've seen over the years uh, mm -hmm. like Chinese coming to take over our businesses for the Republic of Kenya and we wonder whether at the university level should we, our, our degrees and our certifications be based on coping because we, we tend to steal a lot of technologies from the, the Chinese and other people. Mm -hmm. So this bill will allow the youth to become more enterprising. Yeah. Yeah. And things like Thank you. And maybe what do you feel about national ethos? Kiswahili should be made maybe one of the main national languages. Do you think that's the right way to go? Yes, that's the right way to go. I mean, Kiswahili is our language. As tuliambiwa na wahenga mwacha mila ni mtumwa. Nae sisi kwa wacha lugha yetu, pia tunakuwa watumwa. And we end up uh, trying to uh, assimilate and adopt uh, their language as well. So uh, that is, the, in terms of the national ethos, those are the, one of the key areas which I think the BBI team did a wonderful job in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just being directed by my director that I don't have time, I don't have time, we'll come in at 9 o'clock. I think I'll get a hold of Mo Wananchi to just get a feel of what they think or what they synthesize. This BBI report will benefit them. This is from the heart of the country and there's this saying that when Nakuru coughs, the whole country catches a cold and this is a very cosmopolitan region, a region that is key in understanding how this trickle-down effect from the proposal at the BBI report will benefit the people. We're looking at things of um, ethos, national ethos and national identity. We're talking about divisive elections, the competition and a negative ethnicity. These are some of the highlights of the report that we do hope once the constitutional referendum begins, they will be able to involve people and engage everyone. But we're not um, just getting back down anytime soon, but we'll be looking at the views from uh, different people in Nakuru County. But at this moment, Gladys, I'm being told to hand over to you, but we will be back with Bo in this big day. The BBI report is being launched at Bomas.
Definitely will be crossing over to Nakuru County later on from 9 a.m. Even as we get more reactions from that region. And speaking of reactions, let's hear from those in Kisumu County. We are now joined by my colleague Oko Okusa. Oko? Well, Gladys, of course, there is huge expectations from this lakeside county of Kisumu. Remember, this is coming just a few days after the head of state, that is President Uru Kenyatta, and uh, opposition leader, or ODM leader, Raila Odinga, visited this town to, in what was largely seen as an effort aimed at uh, drumming up support for the BBI report, which is being launched today. Of course, the president and uh, the ODM leader, Raila Odinga, urged residents here to throw their weight behind the BBI report that was on last week on Thursday and even uh, urged the county assembly of Kisumu to pass the report uh, when it is tabled before the house later on after the launch of today. And of course, therefore, there is a lot of expectations and reactions from residents that we'll be bringing you uh, in a short time. And uh, of, there are issues, of course, that were proposed by residents to the BBI committee when it visited the town here, that is last year on June 6th. Uh, key among them being the uh, system of governance, corruption, devolution, and all that uh, as we go through the report has been to some extent captured and therefore the residents here are uh, a bit uh, excited uh, about uh, the whole report and of course we'll bring you those uh, reactions uh, in a short time as i've just mentioned there back to you gladys Thank you, Oko. Looking forward to the reactions from that region. And as I mentioned earlier, NTV will be going live with that uh, ceremony happening at the Bombers of Kenya as President Uhuru Kenyatta and ODM party leader Raila Odinga unveil the Building Bridges Initiative report to the public. And uh, our reporters across the country are all keeping an eye on the same, even as we take in your reactions as a citizens to the same. But for now, let's get back to the conversation in studio and it's focusing on the third biennial conference on the status of higher education in Kenya and we have been putting focus on the status of the same amidst the COVID-19 disruption and uh, uh, Professor Tor, there has been a great worry among learners and stakeholders that the current disruption might translate to higher fees in institutions of higher learning. How can this be addressed and uh, still keep the institutions running? I think you're glad this. I think on on the contrary, um, the steps and measures that universities have taken to respond to this disruption might provide, uh, as you put it earlier, you know, give some silver lining in, in that disruption. In the sense that if we uh, make our systems, online systems, work well and work effectively, and we adopt them, it might lead to lowering of costs of delivery because we will be seeing a situation where students need not come to the campus full time. They can take their lectures and lessons in the various remote centers across the country. So that element of movement, accommodation will be well taken care of. Uh, but that is something that will come later because uh, we must uh, ensure that online programs are done effectively and meet the threshold of quality. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, being on site, we know that there are certain protocols that the Ministry of Health have put forward mm -hmm. that might uh, imply costs on the part of the university. But I think these are uh, temporary measures that are supposed to uh, make sure that students who are just about to complete the exams come and do that and complete their semesters. Uh, but the long term, uh, uh, impact and the long-term planning will be the development of these uh, online systems that if it takes root might lead to uh, these systems being uh, taken up and we build confidence in them and use it to roll out programs and and by the way we've seen how uh, graduations have been held virtually mm -hmm. and initially there were some apprehension about it but gradually we are appreciating that it can be done. So we need not all converge here in Nairobi, for example. If your N is graduating, you can actually graduate in, in anywhere you are, and that is it. So that in itself is, a, is an example of how this disruption has uh, led into us thinking 
that we can do certain activities virtually and minimize costs. So uh -huh. I see that as, as, as going to change the game while doing things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Professor Chacha, how are you going to keep tabs on some of those rogue universities, especially in the private sector, that might not adhere to the protocols you put in place to ensure that they do not hike the fees? I think that is uh, very critical. We have developed protocols of how to evaluate uh, the quality of the delivery and quality of the materials. We are going to improve and uh, keep checking on the universities in terms of our interactions. Mm -hmm. So it calls upon the commission as a regulator to ensure that uh, we are not just saying because it is online delivery, our normal inspection, uh, checking of the universities on matters of quality, on matters of preparedness, on matters of qualification of the deliverer, because it is also possible for universities to take advantage mm -hmm. that because it is not uh, in a situ, uh, students are not there, you are somewhere, mm -hmm. they use people who are not qualified. I think we have put uh, protocols, we have put standards, and we're going to ensure that uh, students are not shortchanged, and therefore the quality of university education uh, will remain the same, whether it is uh, a program that is offered through the online uh, delivery or a program that was offered earlier through the face-to-face uh, -face interaction between lecturers and students. Uh -huh. And speaking of face-to-face, -face, what is the future of university education post-COVID if there ever was going to be something like that? Do you see institutions, so, you know, I mean, universities going back to the traditional face-to-face -face, or are we now adopting technology going forward and probably giving uh, an option to those courses that need face-to-face -face interaction, Professor Toll? Yeah, thank you. Uh, what I see the future going to be like it will be there, there will be there's going to be a gradual transition to embracing technology it will not happen you know overnight or, or within a very short time but in the long in the long run we are seeing universities going to continue uh, developing and exploring uh, use of technology uh, perhaps as a start point, they might want to blend uh, online learning and face-to-face -face mm -hmm. so that uh, part of the uh, learning will be done face-to-face -face and part of it will be done uh, online. And now that we have seen that it's possible to actually deliver learning through online, uh, the faculty and the management have come to appreciate and they're liking it because uh, if you can deliver your lecture in the comfort of your home or the comfort of wherever you are, I see that going to proceed on. And that is going to help the sector to grow in terms of uh, integrating technology and in terms of uh, making sure that uh, quality delivery of material is sustained. So yes, post-COVID, this will continue. We are going to embrace it, it's going to last. It okay. will not go back to the traditional way of, uh, of doing it. And uh, like, just like uh, uh, new things take time to take root, mm -hmm. I think uh, from where we've begun, though it came on, uh, on a very tough way, we will take it up and sustain it. Okay, and Thank Professor Chacha, before we get to hear the nitty gritties of the upcoming conference, earlier on you touched on maybe reviving the conversation around merging of institutions and perhaps in this case to harness the technological infrastructure needed. Speak about that. I first of all think that it is important for us to say during the conference we'll be exploring uh, the gaps so that uh, some of those universities you're worried about mm -hmm. uh, will uh, get to know. Uh, the institutions which have challenges in adopting the technology in as far as offering of their programs is concerned. Then from there, we're going to explore the possibilities and opportunities that this pandemic has exposed us to. For example, we have been talking about how to merge universities, how to talk about using, uh, uh, minimizing uh, uh, our, our expenditure uh, on the human resource capacities in the universities. 
And I see that uh, this uh, opportunity that is being offered to us or presented to us through technology is a great opportunity that we at the commission and uh, the universities, we should sit down and start conversing. So that perhaps it's a high time where universities, four of them or five of them, can uh, agree that uh, one subject will be taught by a professor in one university, mm. and therefore that one subject is accessed by students from a number of universities, but the professor who is teaching is one, and therefore the payroll will be focusing on one professor who is offering uh, the teaching, and uh, the other professors will be doing other things. And if we explored that possibility, we'll find that uh, that worry that university is hard about uh, merging and the consequences of merging. We'll just come gradually, as uh, 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 <laughs> Professor Toa said. Yeah. We'll find ourselves moving into a terrain that allows us to justify and rationalize the utilization of our human resource capacity without uh, uh, worrying about the, the, the students' offering without worrying about whether students will be accessing the education uh, uh, the way they have been accessing. Okay, and uh, Professor Tor, the third biennial conference of the Cities of Higher Education is coming up Wednesday and Thursday. Who is it bringing together? Uh, it's, uh, thank you. It's going to bring a, a wide range of uh, participants. We have uh, invited universities, the management of the universities, the vice chancellors, we have also invited uh, heads of departments, deans from the university, and students uh, who will be selected by the vice chancellors to participate. We also have other stakeholders from our sister agencies, uh, the, uh, for example, NACOSTI, uh, NRF. Uh, we have also invited KICD, NEC. Um, uh, we also have uh, the other agencies, Kenya and COOP. So all this. Uh, officers and staff from these institutions will participate in the conference mm -hmm. because we are partners and we're in the same sector, same space. We also have uh, speakers from outside Kenya, in the UK and Canada and our East African region. From Makerere we have speakers from Makerere, Tanzania. So all this will converge together to share and exchange ideas and discourse on how they have been able to uh, rise up to the disruption in their respective areas of jurisdiction. So we really look forward to having them all uh, engaging uh, very, very strongly. Okay, yes. that is Professor Jackson Toh, who is the Head of Planning, Research and Development at the Commission for University Education. Professor Chacha Negoti, Chacha, Chairman of the Board, Commission for University Education, talking about the third biennial conference on the status of higher education that will be held Wednesday and Thursday of this week. It is a virtual conference and uh, the theme this year is technology and quality university education in an age of disruption. Thank you gentlemen for being part of this conversation and giving us insights on the status of higher education in Kenya and thank you for joining us on this conversation. Remember from 9 a.m. we cross over to the Bombers of Kenya where the unveiling or the official unveiling of a BBI report to the public will be happening. We have Kennedy Morethi who will be joining us from the Bombers of Kenya and we also have our reporters across the country capturing your reaction to the same. Now tomorrow I'll be joining you here even as we take a different perspective to matters uh, uh, of life and one of those is actually employees welfare. We are living in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. What are those impacts on employee welfare and what can employers do to ensure they safeguard their well-being? Well, we we'll talk more about it tomorrow. See you then.